I know I, one time I forgot to record a presentation and it's like, well, sorry, everybody. <laughs> but um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we are recording this presentation and we are so excited because today is our, our first Horticulture Landscape Matters program here in our new extension office. So, yay. So we're so, I mean, I know, I know you all are excited. Y'all have been, you know, going to Yuli Annex for a long time and looking at this place for years now. So it's exciting that we're here. This is the first one. Um, so this is a big, big moment for, especially I know all of our Master Gardener volunteers. Um, so today's program is Zoe's Garden. It is being recorded. Um, and for today's program, we're gonna talk a lot about pollinator gardens. Um, if anybody online has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring them throughout the program. Um, but today's program is going to be by Lindsay Picard, one of our new Master Gardener volunteers. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about like our, our new program, Zoe's Gardens, but also a little bit about pollinator gardens and how to prepare and plan them from the landscape. So I would like to go ahead and just kick off the program. Um, and I'd like to welcome Lindsay to the podium, I guess. Roller cart. <laughs> This is odd giving a presentation with headphones on. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay. Welcome. We're going to talk about Zoe's gardens today, which are creating gar uh, gardens to support pollinators. All right, some objectives that we're going to do. Um, we're going to follow the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping and how to incorporate them into our gardens. Um, we're going to talk about Florida pollinators, and we're going to talk about pollinator plants, how to design your gardens, and how to plan them out. All right, so the Florida friendly landscaping principles are really important when we're starting to look at building pollinator gardens. And luckily, all of these principles, if managed correctly, will support your pollinators, and we'll learn how. So who is Zoe? Zoe is a zebra long-winged butterfly from the children's book, Zoe's Mission. The story of Zoe, tra uh, she travels through an urban landscape, encountering many dangers along the way. Four other butterflies are introduced and many other pollinators and their life cycles. The book was written by the previous NASA Extension Director, Rebecca Jordy, and illustrated by Master Gardener, Joanne Roach. Proceeds from the book are donated to the UF IFAS horticulture program, specifically in support of 4-H programs like the Zebra Project. Zebra Project is uh, designed to get children and adults really interested in observing caterpillars and their chrysalis and charting them. The program also focuses on increasing the number of zebra longwing butterflies, which is our state butterfly. This project gave birth to Zoe's Gardens program, and this is the program that I'm leading. Our goal is to encourage residents, youth, and local businesses to come together for a common goal of supporting our threatened pollinators through avocation and education. Zoe's Garden will essentially restore and conserve Florida's native plants and pollinator habitats. And it's going to be done by redeveloping cleared lands. We're encouraging youth, adults, and families alike to plant their own gardens throughout the community. By providing these spaces for Zoe and other pollinators to eat, to pollinate, and to reproduce, the gardens will serve as pollinator corridors throughout Nassau County. It'll preserve butterfly migratory paths and habitats. Master Garden volunteers are planning to create Zoe's demonstration gardens which will become community education centers for native plants, garden maintenance, butterflies, and other pollinators. Master Gard Gardener Beverly McNeil, along with a couple of other MGVs, will be rolling out an education unit to Flor of Florida butterflies to elementary schools. They'll be learning their life cycles, which is a core standard for Florida schools. We'll be leading public education events for residents, landscapers, private businesses, and, commu and community buildings like churches on how to install and maintain these pollinator gardens. 
All right, so in the spring, we're rolling out the program, as I just had mentioned. We're gonna find a few different locations for these demonstration gardens, prepare them, and then, so in the fall, that's what we're aiming for, be on the lookout for these dem demonstration gardens and educational opportunities. The winter is when we're gonna be looking to get into schools and introduce these education units. All right, so I have a question for everybody. Now that we know about Zoe, um, what is the most abundant insect you think on the planet? Or excuse me, I said the question wrong, I just gave it away. Of all organisms on the planet, which is the most abundant? I messed that one up. It's insects. I love this picture because it illustrates the abundance. So each size of every organism correlates to their abundance. And as you can see, insects rule the world. All right. Is anyone surprised by that, even though I messed it up? <laughs> All right. So what is an insect? There's 13,000 known insects in Florida. Only 1% of them are actually injurious, meaning that they feed on plants and um, people, wood, fabric, animals, things like that. The rest can be beneficial. They provide services like pollination, of course, but uh, decomposing, aerating soils. They can be biocontrol for weeds and pest bugs and they can provide food and um, products. Insects, as we know, are six, have six jointed legs, three body regions, and a pair of antenna, usually one to two pairs of wings as adults. The most important thing to know about insects, though, is that they go through metamorphosis, whether it is a complete metamorphosis, which happens when the egg does not resemble the adult, or incomplete, where the nymph does resemble the adult. Reason why it's important to know that there is a life cycle that occurs, because if you're trying to attract butterflies to your garden, they're going to look very different as caterpillars than they do when they're adults. All right, so if there's so many insects, what makes pollinators so important? Insects provide us with many types of ecosystem services. An ecosystem service is a tangible benefit that organisms provide for humans. Uh, for instance, a healthy ecosystem, um, we have a stronger economy, more diverse food products, advancement in medical research as a result of wildlife and natural ecosystems. Pollinators are a keystone species, meaning without them, life on earth would no longer exist. I've seen estimates range, and it's usually between 75 to about 95% of all flowering plants require pollination for reproduction. That's about over 180,000 different species of plants that depend on pollination. These plants provide enormous ecosystem services by cleaning our air, stabilizing our soils, and supporting other wildlife. Pollinators therefore become an indicator species of the health of our environment. All life depends on plants. The majority of plants depend on pollinators. Not to mention food. About 1,200 crops depend on pollination. Poll pollination is critical to our food industry and it's estimated that there's about 200, or excuse me, um, yeah, $217 billion. It adds about $217 billion to our global food economy. At least one out of every three bites that you take daily is due to pollinators. All right, so who all are pollinators in Florida? There's about over 20,000 bee species worldwide. They're the dominant pollinators of the ecosystem. Nearly all bees pollinate. We're gonna talk about native bees for a little bit, not the honeybee. Native bees, they're the workhorses. They're also cavity nesters and ground nesters. So what a cavity nester is, it hides in twigs, hollow stems, beetle burrows, or insights above ground. They include mason bees and the wool carter bee and various other resin bees. The bubble bees are also social insects and excellent pollinators. They have a long tongue so they can, poll um, they can reach pollen from complex blooms and they're capable my favorite part about them is they're capable of thermal regulation, which means that they actually shiver. So they can take 
full advantage of cooler temperatures and are usually the first ones out in early spring and last ones out until late autumn. They also perform buzz pollination, which is said to be extremely effective for spreading pollen. Believe it or not, flies are our most second frequent visitors of the majority of flowering plants with about 120,000 species of flies. We know them best as hoverflies. So flower flies and bee flies, they're great pollinators because they pollinate a range of flowers. They're generalists. Their larvae, or as we know, maggots, are beneficial because they feed on aphids. They're used, so therefore they're used as beneficial control or biological controls, excuse me, in the farming industry. Both bees, both flies, both of these type of flies, excuse me, resemble bees, but they only have two wings and they don't sting. Flies can visit more than 100 cultivated crops, including cacao, peppers, mangoes, apples, pears, peaches, plums, strawberries, and countless of other wildflower species. Some of them gather food from the form of nectar or pollen, or they'll just mate on the flowers so their larva can eat the tissue of different types of fruits and flowers. Beetles, which might be a surprising pollinator, but they, <clears throat> So uh, beetles such as the flower beetle, um, pollen beetle, soldier beetle, and firefly are essential. They're attracted to large and heavily constructed bowl-shaped flowers that are usually white or green. They offer copious, and these flowers usually offer copious amounts of pollen as a food source. Some of the more popular flowers that, we, that you might recognize are magnolias, water lilies, and anises are all pollinated by beetles. And then we have wasps. <laughs> they're not fuzzy and they're the social cous cousins of bees. They have a bad reputation because of how aggressive they can be. But a lot of other insects rely on their aggressive predatory behaviors because, um, excuse me, uh, they have a huge role in keeping a balance in the insect population. They're typically not aggressive to humans unless they're provoked. There is the exception of yellow jackets. They're usually most aggressive in autumn when they're looking for the last bits of pollen to go ahead and feed their queen so they can survive through the winter. Moths are in, uh, inadvertent pollinators. They don't really gather to eat pollen or nectar, but they will visit different flowers and their hairy bodies make them excellent pollinator distributors. Um, between flowers. They go to flowers looking for mates and to lay their eggs. Many plants actually depend on the nocturnal visitations of these moths um, to max maximize seed production. And then we have our favorite, the flashier of the group is the butterflies. Um, they're the best pollinators because they're one, beautiful. They visit, usually typically visit gardens full of native plants as adults. Unfortunately, most of their host plants, like clo clover and thistle, are considered weeds and are disappearing from our landscapes. Providing different types of nectar-rich native flowers in clusters encourages a variety of butterflies to visit your gardens. But it's not just insects. Birds, rodents, reptiles, bats, squirrels, wind, rain, and even people pollinate flowers. But there's about 1,500 species of mammals and birds that have been reported to transfer pollen between flowers. Quick spotlight on bats, there's about 18 species of 200 in Florida. Bats greatly reduce the population of mosquitoes and other bothersome insects like wasps and beetles and gnats and things like that. But more than 500 species of, um, uh, more than 500 species of plants are pollinated by bats. Hummingbirds are great pollinators. They drink up to two times their weight of nectar each day. They usually visit brightly colored flowers. While the nectar provides energy, they actually eat insects for protein. So insects provide a role for hummingbirds as well. But what's alarming is that pollinators are on the decline. NPR in 2018 reported that there is a decline of 60% of butterflies and caterpillars in the state of Florida. The World Wildlife Fund in 2018 reported, uh, which tracked 4,000 species of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians, reported that we had lost 60% of the world's population from 1970 to 2014. Many populated, uh, pop, 
pollinators are in decline and it's attributed to loss of um, feeding and nesting habitats. Their habitats are disappearing. Pollution and misuse of chemicals, disease, agricultural intensification, changes in our climate and competition from non-native species. Again, the honeybee. <laughs> Any loss in biodiversity is a matter of public concern, but losses of pollinating insects may be particularly troublesome because of the potential effects on plant reproduction and food security. So what can we do? We build gardens. Gardens can restore natural habitats. If everyone, homeowners, govern governments, private industries made the effort, we could change the future for these pollinators. This is the message that Zoe's Gardens intends on delivering. Building pollinator gardens in our yards and throughout our community will ensure a valuable, will ensure our valuable pollinators have the resources they needed to thrive. Butterfly gardens supply nectar, which is their food source, pollen, which aids in plant reproduction, and places for pollinators to raise their young and shelter. We are creating habitats. Building habitats with nectar and host plants enables butterflies and other pollinators to complete their life cycles. We have the opportunity to choose how we want to manage our land and turn empty landscapes into flourishing habitats. So how do we do it? There's three components to restoring habitats. And that is we need food in the form of nectar, foliage for host plants with caterpillars, and pollen, water, many different types of ways to provide water, but all pollinators require moisture in some shape or form. Shelter, shelter from weather conditions and predators. Having these allows species to grow, mature, and successfully reproduce and persist in time through their offspring. We have to incorporate all three components, not just some of them, to restore a habitat. If all three are not met, most likely the pollinators will seek refuge somewhere else. With these three things in mind, let's talk about some guidelines in creating a successful pollinator garden. All right, so those guidelines, right plant, right place, shelter, water, we just talked about those, providing native plants, practicing integrated pest management skill or best practices, abundance and diversity. This is so important for our gardens. All right, so the first thing you can do is get your pH tested <laughs> in your soil. Our extension office, uh, office holds free pH testing. It's vital because plants have a preferred pH range. If those ranges are not met, plants will not uptake nutrients. Doesn't matter how much fertilizer you pump into the soil, it won't make a difference. Instead, the fertilizer will tend to run off and seep into our water supply, causing more pollution and more danger for pollinators. Understand the pH you have and then select the plants you want that will do well in that range. Think about sunlight requirements. Full sun does not always mean full Florida sun. <laughs> our wildflowers will do fabulous in it, but if you're selecting cultivators that aren't native or are not our native wildflower, you might want to harden them off before you transplant them. See how they do in that spot. Consider your moisture requirements, medium drained, well drained, moderate, moist, wet. These are all terms that are used to describe types of soil conditions and water conditions that plants need. It's a good idea before planting to see how your water or how well your soil drains, flood the area, see how fast the water sinks through. Watch what happens after rainstorms. So especially if you're new to the area, which I know you guys are not, um, right now it might look high and dry, but as soon as the rains come in June, what looks dry could be under an inch or two of water for a substantial period of time. Luckily, we do have a lot of plants that thrive with wet feet. <laughs> Consider yourself salt tolerance. It's safe to assume that you, if you live in Florida, you're going to have a little bit of salt exposure at some point. Airborne salt can affect plants within an eight mile range of water coastlines. High surf conditions carry salt inland. Um, so coastline gardens, if you're near in that eight mile range, make sure you're selecting varieties that have salt tolerance. When plants are affected by salt, they kind of look 
not the best. They have excess, they look excessively dry or yellow and, and they have brown leaves, even if they've been well watered. Salt accumulation, even in small amounts, causes soil problems for sensitive plants. After large weather events or periods of drought, irrigation can become contaminated with salt as well. This is known as saltwater intrusion. It affects wells and reclaimed water sources. In wells, saltwater intrusion occurs as fresh water resources are contaminated and salt water enters the well aquifer sources. Reclaimed water is clean appropriately for alternative use, but it also might have a higher salt contact than your domestic water. Soil and irrigation water testings are, good, are two good places to start. Our extension office also offers those. And then consider your wind breaks. Be mindful of the direction the wind is coming from. Butterflies and other pollinators typically need um, open spaces, but they should be protected from harsh winds. So plant a tree or a shrub or have it up against your house, depending on where the wind's coming from typically. Another important thing is to group like plants. Pollinators are more likely to stop when there's multiples of plants instead of one singular out in your garden. And <laughs> this is my fault. I do this much too often, but it's so important. Plant according to the plant size at maturity. So you can lower overcrowding. You might get a nice plant and it looks real small and then it will grow to 15 feet. It's very important to look at the size of maturity before you plant it. This will reduce the amount of disease and issues you have later down the line. Okay, so how do we provide shelter? There's a couple different ways. A, bead, a beetle or a bird grass bunch is great because it serves as hibern hibernation, nesting, and it's a food source for birds when the grasses go to seed. They're also really beneficial in vegetable gardens because they harbor beetles that affect your vegetables or they are, that are predatory to the insects that affect your vegetables. All right, so you can grow a meadow if you have the space, just a small patch will do, or a prairie. Uh, makes a great shelter for all pollinators and it's a food source. You only have to mow, mow it about once a year and cut it back to about 18, 24 inches to allow non-aggressive species grow up. But leave the tall dead stalks through winter. This is a place for cavity nesting insects like bees to overwinter. You can add a rock pile. They're great because they are a habitat for a diversity of beneficial insects and other wildlife. They find shelter between the stones and between the soil and the stone. And then we come to deadwood, snags, log or brush piles. It's very rare you see dead trees in our landscape anymore. We clear it out as fast as we can, but the truth is, they're not, they're not an eyesore. They are its own ecosystem. They're homes to many different insects. They're nesting sites to birds and bats. They become a hunting ground for birds. If you don't like the way it looks, use it as a trellis for something like the passion vine, and it will look gorgeous. And you'll have flowers and provide shelter. Uh, if you don't have any dead trees in your yard, don't worry. You can have a brush pile, which will also work as a great shelter for many different insects. Not only that is that they break down material that you can use for your gardens later, later on and that provides valuable organic matter and it reduces the burden on our um, waste management system. If you can open dirt, or bare ground, nearly 70% of our native bee species nest in the ground in loose undisturbed soil. Ground nesting bees are usually solitary unlike wasps and you only see one, maybe there'll be some larvae in the nests, but unlike wasps who are really busy and in large numbers in the summer, you don't have to worry about ground nesting bees. So in these gardens, because we have ground nesters, it's really important, maybe you forget about the landscaping fabric so they can access the soil. All right, so if you're gonna use a commercial pollinator shelter, we see them for sale everywhere. They're great if they're maintained properly, if they're not cleaned out at least once a year, then they are, tend to have parasitic and uh, disease issues. So make sure that you do clean those out yearly. And also you hear a lot of people say, reduce the lawn, reduce the lawn. Uh, but 
in my opinion, lawns are safe places for kids and for families and for pets to go and enjoy. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. What I like to offer is maybe incorporate them into your butterfly garden. Reduce the monoculture of just one specific lawn grass. You might have heard people say it's a freedom lawn. They're letting the weeds run wild. wild. But once you identify what an invasive weed is, then you can add other different types of plants like frog fruit, sunshine mimosa, that does extremely well in our gardens. And our grass is not bad. Our most popular St. Augustine grass supports about six different species of butterfly and so does the non-native Bermuda grass. So when you do introduce these other plants, then you are creating an extension of your butterfly gardens. Not to mention that they use less water. You don't irrigate them, you don't fertilize them or anything like that. It, not very much maintenance input. Leave the leaves. This is a whole entire ecosystem as well as rock piles and deadwoods and snags. Again, hunting ground, overwintering sites. A lot of bu butterflies will um, lay their eggs and then they'll, the caterpillars will wrap themselves in the leaves for protection. And many cocoons actually, or chrysalises, excuse me, actually look like dry dead leaves. All right. So you have to provide water, many different ways to provide water. You can do a puddling area, puddling dish, insect um, watering dish, fruit feed, uh, I can't speak today, <laughs> fruit feeders, or pond in a pot, wildlife ponds, bird baths. Make sure they have about four hours of direct sun because again, butterflies really like sunny open areas. Okay, make sure that you plant native. Um, when selecting areas for your gardens, when we plant native, we manage our landscapes in a way that gives back to our ecosystem. When we clear land and alter the landscape for de development, we remove natural resources in which everybody depends on. Rap uh, Florida's rapid urbanization impacts pollinators and makes it difficult for them to survive, as we know. And Florida has the third richest diversity of wildlife and plants of any state in the nation. By planting native, we're putting back and we're preserving some of what is rapidly disappearing. Okay, avoid pesticides and reduce chemical misuse. I'm not gonna tell you you can't use pesticides. I'm just gonna ask you to avoid them. Identify the pest correctly. You might think that you're saving your plant, but what you're doing is you could be disrupting the nat natural cycle and balance of predator and prey. And then keep in mind the toxic load of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and fertilizers all together. While it may say it's safe for one type of insect, when you combine all of those things, then it becomes a very heavy toxic load and is just uh, destructive to our pollinators. Another thing I just want to mention is about synthetic pesticides. They stay in the plant's material and grows with the plant. The pollen and nectar often becomes lethal. Many plants are grown like this, so ask your nursery before you buy them if they're grown with systemic chemicals, or take a look at the plants before you buy them. If they've been eaten a little bit, they might be safe. All right, plant in abundance and diversity. Again, make sure your area is in full sun. And as I said before, the more colors and floral groups that are grouped together, the more pollinators you'll attract. They'll see it's an opportunity. Try to avoid hybrids because they have little to no nectar. Include a host and a nectar plant, a variety of colors and heights. Use ground covers and shrubs to do that. And try to plant them in a tiered height um, to mimic nature. So we'll start low and then it goes up eventually. But I do want to caution you when you plant for pollinators, you're planting for all wildlife. So you'll start to see other wildlife coming in here that might not be desirable. You might see more lizards and maybe some mice and some snakes and things that we don't typically want in our yards. However, you are feeding an ecosystem and um, we're creating a sustainable ecosystem for all creatures. So when you're deciding on your garden, you have to figure out what kind of butterfly do you want to attract? This is probably the easiest way to go about it. Since there's 160 different types of butterflies in Florida and over 200 that migrate through. You have to choose a host plant 
and a nectar plant. Okay, so the butterflies of Florida. We have the swallowtails. These are just a few, there's tons more, but these are a couple highlight, and this is what you'll be wanting to look for when you're choosing a butterfly for your gardens. You wanna see what their host plant is, their nectar plant, their life cycle so you can identify when they are caterpillars or eggs, their habitat, and there's just some notes about their backyard behaviors. So again, the swallowtails are the largest, they're thick bodied. They usually feed on birthwort, custard apple, carrots, citrus, laurel, magnolia, olive, and rose families. We have whites, orange tips, and sulfurs. And these guys um, feed on, the orange tips usually feed on plants mostly in the mustard family, but a few species also eat in the salwort and spurge families. Sulfurs, they mostly eat things in the pea family, and some also use asters, caltrop, and carpet weed. They all look similar too. <laughs> Hair streak, harvesters, and blues. This, this species actually, some of them can attract ants to help protect them against other predators. Um, they feed on young leaves, flower buds, developing fruit, especially of the hackberry, heath, hollow, mallow, mistletoe, pea, pine, spurge, sweet leaf, and zamia families. The, harvest, uh, the harvester caterpillars, they're actually the unusual ones out of the bunch because they'll eat, they're carnivorous. They'll actually eat woolly aphids. And then we have the metal mark. There's only one metal mark in Florida. They are a diverse group of tropical butterflies. Uh, they're not as slug shaped as the rest of the caterpillars and it's one of our tiniest caterpillars here in Florida. Then we have the brush foots and this is their one of the there's six different subfamilies. This is the widest diversity of butterflies that we have. They also include ones that we know and love like the monarch, the zebra longwing, our state butterfly. If a lot of them feed on hackberry trees, sedges and grasses, um, and of course, milkweed, like I had mentioned. Then we have skippers, which also feed on grasses. And there's about three different families in Florida. Okay, top plants. So these plants were picked um, because one, they support the greatest number of pollinators. They provide color all season. They're easy to get and they're easy to grow and they're sustainable for our landscapes. And they're mostly all native. So we have ironweed, which is loved by all pollinators. Goldenrod, which is a champion for bees. Aster, which are loved by butterflies. Milkweed, which is a great host and nectar plant. Sunflower, which is easy and fun, blooms all year. You can plant them all year. Try and stay away from January. Flatwoods plum, I picked this tree because it is a small enough tree getting about only 20 feet tall. Its fruits are edible. Lantana, if you choose a native variety, it's a great shelter and nectar plant. Coral honeysuckle, which is a vine. Hummingbird and butterflies absolutely are delighted by this. Fakahatchee grass is a great shelter and host plant to many different um, butterflies. Oh, we have a question. Okay. Yes, they'll be available at our plant sale in May. Turkey tangle frog fruit as well. That's the ground cover that also is a host and nectar plant. All right, so for trees, this is the top trees that I had picked out. You see the flatwoods plum, it's beautiful when it's in flower, a live oak, Virginia willow, all of these are either host or nectar plants. You'll see the number of supported caterpillars on the side that's from the National Wildlife Federation. Some of the numbers, um, I think for our area, you'll see ones without a number. They still provide a great deal of wildlife, I just couldn't get the actual number of caterpillars it supported. So it doesn't mean that they don't, it just, I don't have the number for them. All right, so here's some shrubs that will attract pollinators. They're a great addition. They are um, great for different types of soils and they're all native to our area.
and some ground covers. I talked about these shortly. We have clover, which is a cool season. You can overseed your yard with clover in October, and then you'll have flowers come the spring. Sun Sunshine mimosa, which is kind of out of a Dr. Seuss <laughs> novel if you look at the little uh, purple flowers, they're adorable, but they take a lot of sun. They don't get very tall. Same thing with turkey tangle. They only get about six inches tall when they're in bloom. Some grasses, again, that they provide shelter, seeds for um, birds and our different host plants. You have them here. Different vines that I really recommend, again, is the hor cor um, coral honeysuckle. We already talked about that. Moonflower attracts bats and moths. And you really want bats around. Oh, the air's turning on. Because <laughs> they can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes in one hour. And then we have the passion vine or the passion flower, which is the host plant for our state butterfly. Here's some excellent perennials. Blazing star, goldenrod, and butterfly milkweed. They're some of our favorites because they are so versatile in their growing conditions. You can pick almost, especially with not just butterfly milkweed, but with milkweed, you can pick a variety that will do well depending on your soils. Some more perennials, another favorite that comes on the top of the list is ironweed and joe pieweed. Again, these are kind of weedy. They're not your typical landscape plants, but they can act as a great background in your pollinator gardens and host a variety of different butterflies and pollinators. And purple coneflower is excellent for shady sites. Some annuals, any type of sunflowers, but our swamp flower, native swamp flower does extremely well. Zinnias, they're the only one on this list that's not native, but they're an excellent nectar plant. And then dotted horsemint, which will spread like crazy and is considered a perennial and annual. They come back and they self-seed. So they, will, they have a tendency to spread. So just keep that in mind when you're planting your gardens. So if you're overwhelmed with that plant list, you can do one a month and that's just what you focus on and build these gardens over time. A good plant for January or any trees in the cold months, or excuse me, in the cold months, any trees are great. But then you have dill, which is a host plant, bee balm, again, milkweed, which is another host plant and nectar plant. For May, you can plant salvia and asters. June is a great time for pineapple sage and pentas, which help with butterflies and hummingbirds. In August, a great plant is buckwheat. And September is goldenrod, and that's when you usually see it to start to bloom. Coreopsis is a great plant for October, and that'll come back year after year. And then for November, we have Kalindia, Kalindia I can never say it right, and American holly. Uh, the birds will love the berries of the holly, and um, beads, bees and butterflies go for both the American holly and Kalindula. If you're limited on space, no problem, make a pollinator pot. The only thing I, would, I really recommend with these is you select plants with different heights, the same moisture requirements, same light requirements, and make sure you use soil with pine bark because that is the type of soil that you can purchase that is very similar to Florida soils. And if you're using native plants, you want something that does have a little bit of similarity. All right, how to create these gardens. First, you got to develop a master plan. Figure out its purpose. Are there, is it for sitting and walking or just walking paths, or is it for viewing afar? Are the hardscapes already established? When creating the gardens, um, you really want to make a goal too. Who is the pollinator that you're trying to attract? This will make your plant selection so much easier. What are their habitat requirements? What are their shelter requirements? What type of host nectar plants, like I was saying before? Look at the area that you're intending to garden. Are there any structures above like power lines that might impede trees, anything underground, on the sides, et cetera? Um, do your neighbors frequently use pesticides and herbicides? Is that gonna drift over into your gardens? These are things to consider. Consider your salt exposure, your wind breaks. Uh, do you have invasive, invasive plant species that already needed to be, to be eradicated? Uh, do you have water access or do you need to install a rain barrel or a cistern to capture storm runoff? 
light exposure. Again, you really want it to be at least minimum four hours a day. Longer is better for butterfly gardens. Keep in mind your soil texture, pH, and quality. We had talked about those earlier. Take measurements of your area so that way you don't overplant it and you know how big those plants get at maturity. And keep in mind the, their tendency to spread over time, like bee balm, as we were talking. And then the plant selection, this is the fun part. Remember to use a variety of colors, sizes, heights, shapes, flower shapes, because there's different uh, proboscis that will drink from different types of flower. So just diversity, that's what it comes down to. The more diversity, the more pollinators that you're going to support. All right, step two, layout. Call 188, it's a free utility locator service, a service at least two, two days before, give them some time to get to your property and map out where you, your utilities are. Mark your gardens. Um, if you're gonna use spray paint, use pink so it doesn't get confused with utility lines. Uh, remove invasives, rake and level it. Step three, install any um, in-ground irrigation pipes or anything like that that you might need to use. Install any hardscape materials like bricks or your trellises, a bench if that's what you're gonna include, any rain barrels. And then you can move to step four, which is preparing and planting the beds. You can amend any soils. It's typically not necessary if you're using native plants. Lay out your plants and adjust them before you plant them to make sure everything looks right. Once you install your plants, add about two to four inches of pine bark mulch, or if you're gonna use pine straw, add about six to eight inches because then it will settle down to two to four inches. Install your micro drip irrigation if that's, what's your, if that's what you're gonna use. Um, water and establish your plants. This really does depend on the variety, the time of year. If you're planting from seed or transplants, really just watch for signs of stress. It takes about, a, depend, again, ten, depending on the plant, it can take a week to a couple weeks to be established. And then enjoy your garden. All right, so we talked about the insects we have, the requirements they need, how, what plants they like, and how to build these gardens, where to get these plants. Taylor had already mentioned our Master Gardener plant sale. It's coming up in May. It's going to be a Mother's Day weekend. The variety of these plants will be available there. You can go to the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. That's that fan page you see and type in a specific plant that you're looking for and it will let you know what nursery carries it. Or my favorite, you can treasure hunt. Going into big box stores or nurseries looking for your specific plant. My word of advice is know the Latin names of the varieties you're looking for. So you don't accidentally buy an invasive species, for instance, Lantana. There is some invasive ones that you should not plant. Same thing with milkweed. So just know what cultivator you're looking for specifically. And then you can order online. If you order online, I just wanna advise you to make sure you're ordering Florida ecotypes, um, especially when we're talking about seeds because a milkweed from the North will not survive very well down here. So just keep that in mind. Good luck and have fun. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, either one. Yes, um, so I've read that it does. I haven't had any success with it personally. UF does have some, do you wanna to add to it? Okay, go ahead. So the question was for those at home is, does lavender grow well here? And the answer is, it depends on the species. If you go to UF um, IFAS and type in lavender, then it will come up with the right cultivator that will do well. Solutions, great. Mona lavender might be the most common. Okay, great, thank you. Good question. Sure, the dead stalks, yeah. So the question was, when can you cut down the dead stalks? And it's wait until late spring, especially if you see new growth on the plant, that's when it would typically be safe to go ahead and cut those stalks down. Um, that's when most of the pollinators have already left. So just wait till you see new growth and then you can cut them back. 
And it's going to change throughout Florida, but here mostly North Florida. Yeah, I would wait probably until March, you'd be safe. Yes. And it's, that's usually typically after we'll have one or two freezes in March, maybe. So yeah, and sometime in March, if there's no freezes in sight, then you're, you're good to go. But we want to leave those homes for the cold weather. Yeah. And I've seen the bumblebees on my uh, broccoli that I've let go to flower. <laughs> they're all over it. So they're out. <laughs> okay. Is there, was there a question online? No. Okay, great. One more question. Yes. Cross pollinate your orange trees. Yeah. Mm, that okay. That's one's going to be for Taylor. I'm not. And, thank you. <laughs> Not the citrus person to ask. So. <laughs> All right. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, the beetle bush. I have um, read a couple of books that recommended planting them, and a lot of beetles will be using them for harbors and shelter. And they're great for your gardens, your vegetable gardens specifically, because they'll come and feed on. Pre um, you know, nuisance insects. No, it's just bunching grasses or clumping grasses. Yeah. Yes, yep. Habitat, if you will. <laughs> yes. So it can be any type of potting soil. I just like to recommend to make sure that the potting soil has some type of pine bark substrate in it. Yeah, you can mix your own. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a million ways to mix soil and none of them are wrong. It's just one that I recommend. All right. Well, I want to thank you all. This is such a honor being one of the first presentator presentator presentation. Giving the first presentation. <laughs> Presenter, thank you, um, here in the new office. And so, thank you. And thank you everybody at home. Thank you all so much for coming. And again, thank you for Lindsay for putting together, together today's presentation. Um, so uh, this is this is obviously has been recorded. So I'll send this out to everybody as well as all the additional resources that were mentioned through the program and some other relevant items, um, including like the link to our butterfly garden app that that's free through our state FFL website. Um, so I'll follow up with everybody with the follow up survey and all of our additional resources, but everything's going to be online on our YouTube page and all the other resources so you can find them at other periods. So I want to thank everybody for joining us online and I want to thank everybody for joining us um, in cyberspace. So I will see you all next time. Take care.